Welcome to Planning, Management, and Leadership for Health IT, Purchasing and Contracting. This is Lecture A, Vendor Selection. The objective for this lecture, Vendor Selection, is to understand the process for selecting new technology. The purchase of computer-related products, hardware and software, many times is the largest annual capital expenditure for a healthcare organization. Software purchases can range from tens of thousands of dollars for a one-practice organization to well into the multi-million dollar level of investment for hospital-wide or multi-practice solutions. Additionally, the ongoing operational maintenance fees for these products generally run around 15 to 20 percent of the initial purchase price annually. With these types of expenses, one can easily see that it is imperative to the success of an organization that the team charged with the evaluation and selection of computer hardware and software select the product that best meets the needs of the organization. The team has to select each product at a price point it can afford from a capital perspective and the organization also must be able to afford the ongoing operational expenses for the life of the product. In this first lecture, we will focus on the processes for evaluating technology, selecting a vendor of choice, and negotiating the purchase of software applications and hardware to support your organization. First of all, you should never buy technology for technology's sake. Everyone knows people, and it may be you, who are always looking for the latest and greatest technology. They stand in line to buy the latest iPhone or iPad. They see a product that they just have to buy because they're curious about how the product will work, or they've got a great idea about how they might use this product to help themselves. Many personnel in IT organizations, as well as in some business units today, especially physicians, fall into this trap. They purchase technology without considering the goals of the organization that they work for. They are more interested in an impulse buy or the glitz and glamour of the latest and greatest thing. Purchasing technology simply because it is the latest and greatest technology is the fastest way to spend large amounts of cash quickly without providing any value to the organization in return. Prior to any purchase, it is imperative that there be a compelling business case developed justifying the project from a functional as well as a financial standpoint. A business case is the rationale for why it is important to the organization to make this particular purchase. Granted, the detail and complexity of a business case for a $20,000 purchase and a $2 million purchase require vastly different levels of development, but there are certain key concepts that all plans should address. The first key concept, as mentioned earlier, is to have an understanding of why you are buying the technology in the first place. What external or internal pressures are being placed on the organizations and what problem are you trying to solve or what market are you trying to enter? These pressures are varied and can change over time. For example, an external pressure can arise from the action of a competitor, such as the opening of a new state-of-the-art imaging center across the street which threatens to pull patients and even physicians from your organization, or the construction of a women's and infants tower that threatens to reduce income obtained by your organization through labor and delivery services. Another reason for purchasing technology comes from internal pressure. Examples of internal pressures that may result in the purchase of new software would include the need to improve patient safety through clinical alerts or enhanced financial reporting capabilities to enable better decision-making through real-time information. Pressure can also be the result of governmental actions where, for example, you feel pressured to meet the meaningful use requirements, comply with the HIPAA high-tech rules, or comply with new or vastly different regulations as a result of CMS billing changes. 
In light of these types of scenarios, each organization will have to evaluate the threat or exposure it currently faces and determine how it will respond. Many organizations will develop an enterprise-wide strategic plan. Before purchasing technology, it is imperative that the CIO of an organization understand the corporate goals set by the executive team and that he or she develop an internal IT plan to support the organization achieving those goals. Purchases should not be made without first checking the organization's strategic plan and determining if the products support their goals. There are three main factors which can influence the process for purchasing of hardware or software. Time, resources, and money. Let's look at each of these in more detail. Most of the decisions most administrators make take place within the span of weeks or months. However, large implementations, such as the replacement of a hospital information system, may take years. But other factors can influence the timeline. Some factors that influence the time for a decision are the loss of vendor support or if a system is dying or dead. In these scenarios, you may not have the luxury of taking a long, drawn-out process to purchase something. You are faced with a true hard stop of a system. In addition, regulatory changes may require immediate attention. We are currently experiencing the Meaningful Use and High Tech Act requirements. Software vendors are scrambling to make sure that they can meet these requirements set out by the federal government, which are slow in coming but fast in terms of deadlines. Time to market pressures affect the time you have. If that new clinic is opening across the street or if there is some threat of losing market share, you may have to strike while the iron is hot. The second factor is resources. Do you have the personnel in place to focus on the investment of dollars and software purchases? Do you have the human time? Is the IT staff available? Do they have the skill sets that you need to go through an evaluation and selection process? Are customers and user staff available? Can they participate in the project as well? If the answers to those questions are no, then you may be looking at bringing in third-party assets, like consultants, to help you with the resource component. The third factor which influences this process is money. As with any purchase, you can spend whatever you want for a product. For a prudent shopper, the amount spent should reflect the need for the product, the requirements, and the risk level of the purchase. To illustrate this point, let's look at the process of buying a new wristwatch. If someone is going to buy a Timex watch, generally that person will walk into a department store or a sporting goods store, take a look at the watches in the case, and make a purchase within 15 minutes based on whether they like the dial or they like this or that function. However, if you are buying a high-end watch, such as a Rolex, which costs thousands of dollars, like most buyers, you will shop around, look at different makes and different models of the watch. In this scenario, you will spend more time finding out if it really meets your requirements and asking if you really need the 3,000-meter water-resistant depth gauge and do you need a rangefinder on your Rolex. That type of purchase requires much more due diligence. The expression due diligence means that you spend enough time to do a good evaluation and check out what you need to before making a decision. Remember, time is money. If you have a team of individuals evaluating the $40 purchase of a Timex, you may spend more money on salaries in the first meeting just to decide if you need a watch than is necessary. However, if you are buying a Rolex or if you are replacing a hospital information system, the price point of the purchase will justify the expenditure of more human resources dollars. So, who gets to decide which software and hardware is purchased? There are a few rules which will help you put together an effective vendor evaluation team. First of all, the team should be structured in a manner that will meet with the top management's approval. One of the primary ways to kill a project 
or to draw negative attention to a selection, is to have the executive team perceive that the project has been conceived and carried out in a vacuum without soliciting the input from other individuals in the organization. To help ensure that your project will meet with management approval, it is essential that the evaluation and selection team be multidisciplinary in approach. This means that there should be representatives from management, functional areas, and technical areas, as well as consultants as needed. The first member of the team comes in the form of executive oversight. A common theme we will discuss throughout this presentation is that the level of executive oversight and the level of due diligence should be driven by the size and complexity of a project. There should be executive oversight of every project. However, depending on the project size and complexity, the executives of the organization may or may not be involved in the daily functions of the team. For the replacement of a hospital information system or a large patient financial application, you would generally want to have the CIO and or the CFO engaged in the evaluation process. However, for a smaller component of a hospital information system, such as the lab system or potentially a document scanning application, it may be enough to have the director of the IT organization or the director of the functional organization engaged in the process, as long as they keep the executives to whom they report involved and keep them up to date as to the status of the project. Are they going to stay within the budget? Are they going to be within the timeline? Each team should also contain functional representatives, sometimes referred to as the functional owners of the product being purchased. In other words, if you are evaluating a laboratory system, the selection team could be led by a laboratory executive. The team should also include individuals from the department that have a keen understanding of the day-to-day -day functions that they are looking to replace, the workflow of the organization, and how the system they have today currently works. Their insight is invaluable when selecting a new product, and their participation on the evaluation team generally assures buy-in for the product, since they were involved in the selection and the evaluation. Technical representatives are generally the IT component of the organization. These folks are interested in looking at items such as the network requirements for an application, the database structure, what types of hardware equipment the software can run on, meaning is it a mainframe or a mid-range computing system? Does the organization have the skill set to support a new piece of hardware that may be brought into the organization as a result of a purchase of software? The technical representatives play the role of supporting the evaluation and the selection. However, they should not drive the decision unless it is purely a technical purchase. The last members of the team are consultants. Organizations bring in outside consultants for a variety of reasons. One may be to supplement existing staff. Some organizations may not have the staff to devote time to a large complex system evaluation or selection process, and consulting staff can help fill the void. Another value that consultants bring to your organization is expertise. Consultants may have selected and implemented numerous products before, while your local team may not yet have that experience. The most important point about the evaluation and selection process is that it should not be viewed as an IT project simply because there are software and or hardware components. It is important to have representatives from all areas affected by the deinstallation of one piece of software and the installation of another because these changes have a direct impact on the daily lives of those functional owners. So, the decision is made to proceed with the purchase of a new software application. What is the next step? Obviously, before you can purchase a product, any product, you need to have an idea of who those companies are that can provide the required functionality. In many cases, through industry experience, you may have some idea of the leaders in a given field. This knowledge has been gained either through past business dealings, 
or because you have become generally aware of them and their product offerings over time. However, there will be times when you have to start from scratch to identify potential vendors for a particular search. Now, let's look at five ways to identify potential vendors. One of the best means for learning the market is to talk to other executives in the field to find out what systems they are using. This sounds like a simple task, and generally speaking, it is. However, when talking to your peers, you need to use a few qualifying questions to get an accurate picture of how the organization is using a product. Talk to those peers whose organizations are of similar size to your organization. Try to determine the scope of use and be sure it is similar to yours. For example, some organizations may only be using part of the product's functionality to meet a specific purpose. Your organization may have a different process or function in mind. Without digging deeper, you may not discover different results between the two organizations. The next is to identify potential vendors at trade shows. In fact, one of the best times to shop for new systems is while attending a trade show sponsored by Health Information Management System Society, or HIMSS, or the Radiological Society of North America, or RSNA. These two events, and others like them, provide healthcare organizations with maximum exposure to the vendor community. If you are about to enter into an IT search of any significance, it is always a good idea to take a subset of if not the whole search team, on a window shopping expedition to a trade show. Prior to going, the team should meet to discuss the desired requirements and identify those vendors you want to target as you tour the exhibit halls. If you are not focused on the front end of this process, your team can quickly become overwhelmed by the sheer number of vendors present and the volume of choices available. The team should develop an evaluation tool to use when visiting vendor booths. Don't make this tool overly complicated. You're really just there to get a better idea of who the vendors are in this market. This tool will come in handy at the end of the week when you're trying to remember what you saw and whether or not it appears to meet your needs. Please note that we specifically use the phrase appears to meet your needs in the previous sentence. The product demonstrations seen at these shows should never be used as a substitute for a formalized vendor evaluation and selection process. One of the best ways to know whether a vendor is a candidate for a new project is based on past dealings with them and their performance in meeting your needs. Many vendors can provide solutions to your request and most will work out fine technically. However, the benefit of having past experience with a vendor is that you have a good idea what they're like to work with over time. Do their products work as advertised? Is their staff knowledgeable? Or do they have a 50% employee turnover rate? Do they listen to your needs and request for bug fixes and or future enhancements? Can you trust their technical advice? Frankly, do you like them enough to want to do business with them again? If, after weighing these questions and thoroughly evaluating their product, you make a decision to contract for a new module. This is an excellent time to renegotiate an existing contract. All of those issues you've been suffering through since you last agreed to work with a vendor are now on the table for negotiation. You once again have leverage over a vendor that was lost as soon as you signed the last contract. Take the extra time to review that old contract, learn from your mistakes, and stand your ground when negotiations begin again. If you've spent any significant amount of time working with them, you should have plenty of issues to use for bargaining chips when sitting around the negotiation table. When looking for a vendor to meet a specific need or one who deals in an unfamiliar area, many times organizations seek the advice and guidance of consulting and or research firms. Due to the nature of consulting, these firms are exposed to a wide variety of vendors and applications. Their experience can allow them to be a valuable source of information. 
The thing to watch for when seeking the advice of a consultant is to be wary of a particular bias they may have due to the potential for future work. Research firms can provide a wealth of vendor-specific knowledge. Firms such as Class and Gartner maintain databases on many of the most prominent vendors. Based on their research, these organizations produce periodic reports on who the leading vendors are in a specific area. Due to the fact that they do not seek additional work with vendors, their evaluations are generally unbiased. In each of these research methods, you should expect to pay for their advice or services. And finally, making phone calls to companies that you don't know is another way to identify potential vendors. However, it is a rare occasion when a cold call leads to the purchase of a software product immediately following the contact. These conversations should be cataloged and used as research for future evaluations and selection projects. This concludes Lecture A of Purchasing and Contracting. In summary, the purchase of the right computer-related products, hardware and software, is a major key to the success of modern hospitals and physician offices. If the evaluation process is not structured correctly from the outset of a project, the results could be costly to the organization in time, opportunity lost, and ultimately money. Software selection projects should not be delegated to the IT team simply because there is a computer involved. While the computer is an integral part of a software project, a system that performs at or above recognized performance benchmarks but does not meet the needs of the daily users may make the IT guys happy, but will not be adopted by the people who use the application to accomplish their jobs. The function and workflow components of the software used by the functional owners on a daily basis is where the benefit of the purchase can be realized. Likewise, a software selection project should not be conducted solely by the functional owners of the organization. There are technical realities that can have a negative effect on an implementation if not taken into consideration before purchase. Failure to involve technical resources could result in a system that is not sized appropriately and not responsive in a timely manner. Therefore, the software will not function in a way that lends itself to daily use by the functional owners. In this presentation, we learned some of the ways to mitigate the risks commonly experienced by IT professionals when starting a project.